Hi everybody, this is Mr. Matthew again with video number two in our heredity series, focusing in on inheritance and variation in traits. Uh, so in this video, what we're going to do is we're going to talk a little bit about variation of alleles and the sources of those variations. Specifically, we'll talk about the new combinations that come through crossing over and the idea of random segregation of chromosomes that happen during meiosis. We'll also talk about mutations as a source that happen during replication or mutations that are caused by environmental factors. We'll also talk about the difference between mutations that happen in body cells versus those that occur within the germline. All right, so here we go. So the first thing that we want to talk about is the idea of genetic variation and the concept of variation based off of alleles. So this is a map showing the distribution of lactase persistence in certain continents of the world. And specifically what we are looking at is lactase persistence in Europe, Asia, Africa, and Australia. And what you'll notice that in some parts of the world, mostly in Northern Europe, we also see a couple of spots in Africa and in um, the Middle East, is that there are large portions of people who are lactase persistent. That means that as adults, they can drink milk. Whereas in large portions of the world, such as in Southern Africa, in most of Asia, in Australia and the islands, we see very little lactase persistence. So what we see here is a single trait, the ability to drink milk as adults, and there is enormous variation throughout the world in that ability. Furthermore, we could talk about the concept of alleles. The fact that that there's this variation that exists suggests that not everyone will have the same copies of alleles. And we saw this in some of our HHMI videos where we looked at lactase persistence and saw that lactase persistence is a dominant allele. And some people have two copies of that, whereas other people only have one. So recognizing that alleles and the combinations of those alleles lead to phenotypes and that those phenotypes vary throughout the globe is a very important thing to realize when we talk about genes and variation. So now let's look specifically at some of the sources of variation that occur. And that includes looking at crossing over creating new variants. So uh, it's important to note that this discovery uh, was recognized by Barbara McClintock when she studied corn. We see here down on the left is Native American corn, and we see this as the type of dried maize that you would see on uh, tables at Thanksgiving. And what we can see is that not all of the kernels that are on here are the same, and that suggests that these individual kernels, which represent potential individuals for the next generation, come from a variety of different sources. And so McClintock had studied these and studied them down to the gene level and actually noticed that there was crossing over events. And that's why we have this picture of Barbara McClintock, because we give her credit. So what does crossing over look like? Down here on the diagram, we see that if you have two genes on the same chromosome. And we see this pink representing the maternal line and the blue re representing the paternal line. When they were to go passing on their genes to the offspring, the big A and the little b would be passed on together. And the little a and the big B would be passed on together. And they would just kind of go on in those uh, familial lines as you would expect. However, McClintock noticed that there was a crossing over or she surmised that there must be some crossing over that occurred that created new recombinant. So because these homologous chromosomes crossed over, you could actually get a parent to pass on, and we see here this in the middle, a big A and a big B, even though neither of the per parents' chromosomes were in that formation. Similarly, you could get a little A and a little B. So you get new combinations of genes occurring when an individual goes to make gametes because of this phenomena of crossing over. Now looking more at meiosis overall, we also can recognize that because when these chromosomes in meiosis line up, and I'll focus in right here, depending on how these chromosomes line up will lead to different combinations. As it shows right here, we're going to have them split up and we're going to have the red and blue, or one of the reds and one of the blues, going down to daughter cells. And again, synapses is already here, crossing over has already happened here. But depending on how they lined up during meiosis one, it could end up that both of the reds would be passed on together or both of the blues would be passed on together. And so what we see here is that 
genetic variation may result from new combinations because of how these lined up and segregated from each other early on and how those chromosomes lined up for independent assortment as well. And independent assortment is the idea that the different chromosomes do not influence each other or more importantly the genes that are on different chromosomes don't influence each other and you have an equal combination of passing on a red big chromosome and a blue small chromosome as you do passing on a big red chromosome with a little red chromosome. So we sometimes say that mutations are the ultimate source of genetic variation because it is these changes on the DNA level that will lead to new sequences of proteins. Now there is a history of people thinking that mutations are bad or mutations lead to harm but just mutations lead to either different proteins being formed or no proteins being formed. And so let's take a look here at um, a sequence on the DNA level. And if our original form is that we, on the DNA level we have TTC, and then that is transcribed into mRNA as AAG, if we look at a codon key we would find that AAG is going to be translated into lysine. Now because there is redundancy in the genetic code, sometimes when you have a mutation and you change a base, like for example here we've changed a C on the DNA to a T, what that means is even though the mRNA has changed, the sequence of AAA also gets translated into lysine. So this is referred to as a silent mutation. We still call it a mutation because we had a change on the DNA level, but the ultimate impact of this is that we do not lead to a different protein being added into, or a different amino acid being added into the protein sequence. In the middle here, what we see is instead of mutating that third base, we're going to mutate the first base. And instead of a T at the first base, we've changed it to an A. And now when we go into transcription, we transcribe into a UAG, and when we go to translate that, that gets translated into the stop codon. This is going to stop the protein from being made. If you imagine that we have a base sequence of you know, 50 amino acids, and this occurs at the 10 amino acid point, instead of making a 50 amino acid long protein, we're only making a 10 amino acid protein, it's going to be a nonsense protein. It's going to lead to a protein that doesn't do anything. And while your first instinct might say, oh, that's a terrible thing, that's bad, if we think back to earlier when we talked about lactase persistence, it could be this type of mutation that led to humans continuing to be able to drink milk as adults. And that there used to be a regulatory protein that would stop that early on in life once we were weaned and now that protein no longer exists because of mutation. The ability to drink milk as an adult is ultimately a positive thing and was a positive thing for survival of many humans early on in history. The last two that we see here are what are known as missense. And in missense, what we end up seeing is, yes, we change the base. And now when we change that base, we end up getting a different mRNA code and then a different protein level code. Now, what you'll notice here is that the arginine looks a lot like a lysine and it has a lot of the same properties. And so even though it is a mutation, it is called a conservative mutation because this protein likely will still fold up and still have many of the same properties as what it was originally there. Now, we don't know that for certain. It's entirely possible that this is going to be significant and it will ultimately impact the folding of the proteins, but it's a protein protein of a, it's going to have an amino acid of similar characteristics and may allow this to even fold better than the previous form. We contrast that with the formation of a threonine, and threonine has very different chemical properties. So in some cases, you're going to switch out a positively charged amino acid for a negatively charged amino acid, or a hydrophobic amino acid for a hydrophilic amino acid. So you're going to change something from one set of properties to another. This is going to radically change the formation of the protein or the folding of the protein, and therefore we call this a non-conservative mutation. 
All right, so when it comes to mutations, the question is what causes mutations? And ultimately what we say is that there are many environmental factors that influence DNA and can lead to a mutation. One of the most obvious of those is the idea of radiation. And specifically on this diagram, we're highlighting UV radiation. So if we have a DNA molecule here and we expose it to ultraviolet radiation, we might see a break in that DNA. And as a result of that break, now the that region of DNA is going to be damaged and may need to be repaired, and we may lose the ability of this segment of DNA to be transcribed and translated into an effective protein. So this is one form. Obviously, other forms of radiation, including x-rays, also can cause mutations to DNA, and that is something that we need to think about. Any chemical that causes mutation is referred to as a mutagen, and there are many known mutagens um, that can also lead to mutations of DNA. So what cells are being mutated? And that's what this diagram highlights. If you have what is known as somatic tissue, and for somatic tissue, this is just the tissue of the body. So for example, we mentioned uh, UV radiation and skin cancer or um, UV radiation and mutation. If UV radiation leads to a mutation of DNA on skin cells and it leads those skin cells to become cancerous, we may end up seeing that there's a mutant sector on the skin, in this case maybe in the upper um, torso, and now there is going to be a mutation there and a change to the property of those cells. But this individual with a somatic tissue mutation will not actually pass that mutation on to the offspring because the genes of the skin are not necessarily going to have any connection with the ability to produce sperm. And so now, even though I have a mutation, it is not in the germline, it is not passed on. We contrast that with a mutation that leads in the germline. Now, that will lead to a change in the DNA depending on what region of the DNA is or how much of the DNA uh, gets modified, we may or we may not pass that mutation on to our offspring. Just because a mutation happens within the germline does not guarantee it's passed on to the offspring, but it increases the chances. If I have something in somatic tissue, that will not be passed on to the offspring. So just to sum up, you should at the end of this video be able to understand about genetic variation, specifically with alleles. You should know that these uh, variations come from new combinations that come from crossing over, also from random segregation of chromosomes during meiosis. You should also know that mutations that happen during replication can lead to new variations and also that those mutations can be coming from environmental factors. You should also recognize that mutations that occur within the germline are going to be the ones that are passed on to offspring. Just so you know, you should have some idea that McClintock worked with corn and the, those uh, studying of chromosomes, similar to the ones that we talked about in the diagram, were what led to the knowledge of crossing over. And we, you should also be aware that the development of cancer due to DNA replication errors and UV ray exposures, if those end up impacting germline, are examples of mutations being passed on or mutations that add new variants or new genetic combinations. You will not need to be able to name the phases of meiosis. You also won't be able to have to name specific types of mutations. Even though I gave you some of the examples during this video, those are not going to be on uh, the new MCAS test. All right, so I hope that was helpful, and I will talk to everybody soon.